Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's third webinar in the Food, Dining and Nutrition series. My name is Janet Anderson, and I'm the Commissioner of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we're meeting right around Australia uh, and paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that acknowledgement and my respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are watching today. Today we have a treat. Uh, we're going to be talking about swallowing and nutrition in residential aged care. And I'm joined by Dr. Melanie Roth, the Commission's Chief Clinical, uh, Clinical Advisor, yeah. and two members of the Commission's Expert Advisory Group on Food, Nutrition and Dining. And they are Kim Teresi, who is the Senior Advisor Aged Care in Speech Pathology Australia, and Nairi Hobbins, who was an accredited practicing dietitian. Now, we've allocated 60 minutes for today's webinar. We are recording it, and the recording will be available from our website. Uh, today's choice of topic is one I know is of keen interest to people working in aged care, because swallowing, like breathing, of course, is essential to everyday life, and typically we take it for granted until it becomes a problem. And while swallowing problems can affect people of all ages, they're more common in older people and it can affect a person's ability to eat and drink, which in turn can affect their mealtime experience and their overall health, which is why it's important. So today, Melanie and our two panelists will explore what residential aged care providers can do to support residents uh, with swallowing difficulties to have a safe and enjoyable mealtime uh, in aged care. And after we hear from the panelists, there will be an opportunity, I hope, for your questions. Thank you to those who have submitted questions in advance. If you have a question you would like to submit, uh, please do it through the Q&A function by clicking the question mark icon, and we'll answer as many of them as we can in the time we have. And at the end of the webinar, before you log off, there will be a five minute online survey available to you. Very keen, if you are willing to, to complete that for us so you can give us some feedback uh, on this webinar, but also on topics that interest you and your organisation and how this webinar series can be put to best use in assisting you in shining in the areas of food, nutrition and dining in your service. Now, just before I hand over to Melanie and the panellists, a couple of important points to close. One is very pleased to announce we will shortly be publishing some really great resources on swallowing, which have been developed uh, with Nari and Kim's input, and here's a, a, a foretaste of them. Uh, they will be available and published on our website for downloading. There are some which face providers, others which face uh, workers, and, and a third set which face consumers. I do encourage you to make use of these resources. I think you will be rewarded for your efforts, and they will be supported subsequently through educational modules we will put online through our Alice platform. And you can find out more about that from our website as well. The second point I want to make is actually a request. Uh, we're very keen to hear from providers and aged care workers about your positive stories and case studies, where you've been successful in improving the food you served, serve, your residents' nutritional status and their experience of eating and dining. Now, we've already published a couple of success stories and they've been well, re well received and they've given bragging rights to the providers concerned. Uh, and so it's a wonderful opportunity to share with others where you have succeeded in this change journey. So please take up that opportunity and let us know. Get in touch, share with us uh, case studies de-identified about things that you've done that have made a difference to the lives of your residents. And now I'll invite Dr. Roth. Uh, to give us an overview and introduce our guests. Melanie. Thanks. Thanks, Janet, very much. Um, I've really been looking forward to this very clinical and practical webinar. It sounds like a simple topic, but there's a huge amount in it. Um, and I, I think we'll, we'll be able to maintain your attention and we're going to try and speed through things. Um, Yesterday was Swallowing Awareness Day, which is promoted by Speech Pathology Australia, and the Commission is very pleased to help in raising awareness and sharing information on this on this topic. Um, I know many of you here will already be familiar with with dysphagia and with assisting people who may be suffering from from some aspect of it to varying degrees. 
Many of you also responded to our invitation to let us know what you're doing to enhance mealtime enjoyment for people with swallowing difficulties. And I want to share with you on this slide some of the uh, ideas we've, we've just received from you. Um, and we will be collaborating this with, with what I hope you will continue to send in to us um, just so that we can share some of these ideas. We really appreciate being able to hear about them, um, particularly where staff can see the difference that even little things have made um, and where staff are excited about this. We'll share them online with the recording. So in today's webinar, we're going to talk about the causes and impacts of swallowing problems. We're going to discuss preventive and collaborative approaches to swallowing and nutrition. We're going to explore the use of texture modified diets and consumer choice around this. And we're going to consider how to maintain good nutrition when people um, have opted for a texture modified diet. As, as Janet mentioned earlier, please submit any questions in relation um, to this through the um, question and answer function by clicking on the question mark icon and we'll answer as many as we can in this webinar but it will certainly help us understand what what you are keen to know and helping me today in covering this range of topics are two experts as as described by Janet from our food and nutrition expert advisory group Nairi Hobbins is an accredited practicing dietitian and she's a, a, a well-established author in in this area and she's focused exclusively on aging aged care and dementia risk reduction over the past two decades. Nairi's passion lies in helping all older people, whether living independently or in supported care, to relish and get the best from food. This goal, which I think is, is all of our goal, informs all her work with aged care providers. Kim Teresi is the Senior Advisor for Aged Care with Speech Pathology Australia, and she's a speech pathologist with over 30 years clinical experience working with older people experiencing swallowing issues. Among her responsibilities, um, is providing support to speech pathologists working in aged care. And that has led to the development of, of the association's new position paper and practice guideline on supporting informed choice for people who eat and drink with acknowledged risk. That's known as EDAR. So Kim and Nairi, it's really a great pleasure to have you both with us today, um, talk about this important topic. So let's get straight to it. What are some of the causes and impacts of swallowing problems? Kim, what do you see when working with residents and providers? Thanks, Mel. Well, we see that swallowing is a really important area to focus on in aged care. Firstly, we know that swallowing difficulties are common. So estimates are that between 15 and 30% of older people over the age of 65 living in the community and around 50% of residents in residential aged care will have some form of swallowing difficulty. Many conditions that residents experience um, also lead to these swallowing difficulties, including things like um, dementia, stroke, brain injury, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, motor neuron disease, a raft of medical conditions, including respiratory conditions such as COPD, as well as sometimes when there are change, temporary changes in health status. So where we see that normal changes associated with aging become exacerbated by a temporary, temporary decline, maybe through a delirium or a UTI, a change in medications, um, they can all be a tipping point that um, creates, ends up creating a, a swallowing difficulty. And swallowing difficulties can really seriously impact residents' health and wellbeing. Whilst dysphagia affects everyone differently, the consequences of dysphagia can be significant and for some can be life-threatening. So we know that choking is the second highest cause of preventable death in residential aged care, second only to falls. And aspiration can lead to significant impacts, including aspiration pneumonia, repeated chest infections, repeated hospitalizations, and even death. Malnutrition, dehydration, and the weight loss that can result often can also lead to increasing frailty and falls. So this is often a root cause within a, a vicious cycle. And we also know that it can affect things to do with quality of life, increasing social isolation and lowered mood. Um, in addition to, I guess, those individual risks, um, the care needs for people with, for dys and dysphagia, there are considerations for providers themselves. Um, so provider obligations under the clinical care standards of the quality care standards, quality standards, sorry, 
and reporting obligations for adverse events reporting in the Series Incident Response Scheme. Um, and another point just to finish off on, I guess, is that this is a multidisciplinary team approach that's needed. Um, we need a collaborative approach across speech pathologists and dietitians with the care team, nursing, medical. Um, dysphagia is not a set and forget process that can be ticked off solely by a single assessment. We really will talk today a little bit further about an overall strategy on food and nutrition. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, meal times can be a time of, of risk and discomfort for people with swallowing difficulties, but they don't always have to be. It's really vital for people working in aged care to have the skills and knowledge needed to support safe and enjoyable meal times. This, this not only applies to the staff on the ground who provide hands-on support to residents, but also to those in senior management who can really make an impact by developing and ensuring good governance and understanding and leading continuous improvement. The Nairi, what connections do you see between the governance arrangements at a service, including its formal policies, procedures, processes for ensuring the high standard of care and residents' nutrition, especially for those with swallowing dis difficulties? What, what are your thoughts on this as a dietitian? Yeah, thanks, Melanie, and thanks, everyone. And um, thanks, Kim, for that wonderful overview. Um, look, I just think, you know, people often think about food and nutrition, they think about standard four because there's a word, you know, about food. But nutrition covers, runs through all the standards. But particularly when you come to number eight, you've got this, um, one of the things that is so important is that unless the entire organisation is involved in thinking about food, nutrition and swallowing, of course, and getting food safely into people's mouths, you don't end up with good outcomes. It's all very well to call in a dietitian, but when I can go in and provide a prescription, but unless um, the organisation is on board, I've got no control over what happens and it may not happen. So what ha one of the things we look for is if, if there is a food and nutrition policy that it takes in an overarching or look at the entire organisation. What are the capacities of the staff? What is the capacity of the kitchen? What is the capacity? Are there moulds? Are there not? What do you want to do? Make a, an organisational decision about what things would work best and then actually feed it through from management level. Everyone needs to be involved, every single staff member. So we've got, you know, you think about the kitchen and the chef and that's often focused on a lot. But actually what I see all the time is that you can have the best food ever prepared or food that isn't quite at the standard of restaurant quality. But that it can be fantastic when it comes out of the kitchen, but unless it goes in someone's mouth and gets safely swallowed, it's not nutrition. So we have to have everyone involved and that that is really important and includes the leisure and lifestyle staff or whatever they're termed in the organisation and the clinical staff and the care staff and anyone who's employed and allied to. So it's it's everyone playing a part in that. That is part of the story. So that's where an overarching policy, which includes focus on swallowing and behaviour around that, but also on nutrition and what we do with food, everyone understands where we're going and then everyone plays a part. It's all about not missing an opportunity to get that nutrition in safely. Thanks, Nairi. So what you're really saying, I think, is that good governance and nutrition um, can't, can't be separated. Uh, we yeah. really can't have one without the other. Look, it makes a huge difference for providers to have an overarching food and nutrition plan outlining their strategies and, and processes and, and to convey that they prioritise it. As we engage with providers, we, cons we consistently see that those who perform better tend to have strong governance arrangements and good communication with staff and residents about those arrangements. We also see good providers taking a collaborative approach to swallowing and nutrition aimed at avoiding problems as far as possible by anticipating them. So I'm interested from, from both of you what you see in good services that, that do make things work well. Um, what role do dietitians and speech pathologists play in assisting providers in, in managing these risks? Kim, we'll start with you there. Thanks, Melanie. An important article was published last year that reviewed cases of death in residential care. It's called Death by Choking or Dysphagia, a review of coronial findings, a picture of preventable death, non-adherence to written recommendations and a lack of appropriate supervision. 
And when it reviewed the cases that um, had gone to coroner's courts and it was found that choking and aspiration pneumonia were a leading cause of preventable death for people in residential care. But a review of those cases found um, an abundance of non-adherence to written recommendations, a lack of um, supervision, appropriate supervision, but a lack of systems and processes to underpin safe and quality care of people with dysphagia. So when we're thinking about good quality care, we want to think about what the overarching plan across the facility is. And um, this will include whole of facility processes and staff training to ensure that um, everyone can play their part in making sure that there are safe and enjoyable meal times. Um, and I refer people to have a, a look at the resources that will go up on the Commission's website as well that will go into this in more detail. But some of those areas that we want to think about is that firstly we need all staff to be able to recognise and act on the signs of dysphagia. There are many red flags that we can see proactively that can indicate to us that there may be a problem or a difficulty emerging. Um, and your speech pathologist can give you a detailed list of those things to look out for and can be your, um, a port of call to engage in staff training in relation to um, addressing the dysphagia needs. But then we also need processes in place that, so each level of staff or whoever they are, um, knows where to go internally to take any information or observations that they've seen. We need things to be in place and understood around processes for referrals to um, the relevant health professionals, um, including speech pathologists. So it's really important to understand the underlying issues to be able to prescribe appropriate management of a swallowing difficulty. Swallowing difficulties are not all the same and they're not all static. Um, so for that, you need appropriate diagnostic assessment, but also appropriate clinical review as recommended. Um, and we know that when speech pathologists are engaged in a more proactive manner and it can provide the appropriate clinical reviews, that facilities have a, a lower use of texture modified food and fluids. Um, we want to ensure that we've got everyone knowing how to support safe swallowing by um, following recommendations, whether that might be using specific recommended mealtime strategies for each individual. Um, they're not necessarily the same what, where we might do something with one person and recommend, say, alternating a sip of fluid with a, a mouthful of food. That might be safe for them, but it actually might be counterproductive for another person and, and dangerous. So we need to uh, um, understand those as well as things like providing an appropriate range and texture of food and fluids. So that will include talking with our kitchen staff and chefs. Um, having processes to ensure that the entire mealtime management plan is communicated throughout systems and staff. So not just the texture, but all of the recommendations that go alongside that, including what mealtime assistance strategies are needed, what sort of level of supervision is needed, et cetera. Um, as it says there, knowing about people's appropriate communication support needs, understanding that choice and control is an important component and having processes in place of what you'll do if um, somebody is choosing not to follow recommendations. And just to finish off quickly, you mentioned, Melanie, that um, what's the role of the speech pathologist in all of this? Um, speech pathologists are integral members of the multidisciplinary team managing people with swallowing difficulties. So as well as assessing, diagnosing and managing the dysphagia directly with the individuals, um, speech pathologists also provide education to staff and family and can support that development of facility processes and governance. Um, and we also obviously provide our specialist expertise around communication and ensuring that the person who may have communication difficulties can also have a, a means to express their needs, their discomfort, their, their choice, etc. I'll hand over to Nairi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, a, a lot of those things apply exactly to dietitians as well. One thing that often happens when people move on to a texture modified diet um, from a nutritional point of view or go up the process, I mean, um, become, require more modification of texture, is that, that often nutrition is impacted. Now, um, 
I'm just going to backtrack quickly to why nutrition actually matters because this is something that I just think I'm sure that everyone realises, but there's a lot more to it than just, oh, people need to get good nutrition because if people have inadequate nutrition, I'm just out of interest, that's probably slide two or three, I think, but anyway, um, um, people's illnesses are more, more, it's more likely people will become ill and and then the severity of the illness has increased if you if you were not well nourished. Pressure injuries are, are higher incidence and recovery slowed. Wounds are re, wound um, repair is slowed as well. There's a higher falls risk if people are inadequately nourished. Um, if people lose body mass, body weight, which means they lose lean body mass, it can also affect diabetes management and clearance of medications. So there's issues with medication um, management as well. And all of those feed into the fact that people have less capacity to look after themselves, so that increases care needs. So ultimately, it ends up costing um, time and money, and that, of course, is a big issue in residential aged care. So that's just backtracking a little to that. But if, if there's been a referral to a speech pathologist, I would always be saying you should be thinking about also looking at a referral to the dietitian. It should always happen because at that stage there's a very high chance that that person might move into not getting adequate food. Now we can look at not only the, um, the nutritional com um, components of the meals themselves but also whether the volume is going to be enough whether that person may need fortification because their interest in the food changes or their ability to manage the food changes. So it's it's a combined um, allied health response to dysphagia, but also it's that, again, the organisation looking at the bigger picture and making sure it's all about, again, not missing opportunities to get nutrition in safely so that you're looking at um, how people are, are, are cared for, but also the clinical management and making sure that when you bring in a change in texture, you're not um, unintentionally creating a nutritional deficit, which then ends up being a problem as well in time. So it's a balance between those. And also, and I'm sure Kim has said it, we've said it before, keep reviewing these things because I see people all the time that I go, well, when was the last time the speech pathologist came and saw them? They seem to have improved. They're going out to a cafe with their, their family and saying they're eating cake or whatever. And actually what's happened is it's been a temporary issue related to an illness or whatever, and they've actually improved in their capacity and no one's actually reassessed it. So make sure that that's always being done. And the same with nutrition. Make sure that, um, that nutrition is is maintained because if people are nutritionally well supplied, they actually are sometimes able to improve in their swallowing ability as well. So it's, all these things need to be reassessed as often as possible. So it is a it is an organisational systems processes, as Kim says, it all goes together, and you really can't separate them because you know food is not nutrition unless it safely gets into your stomach and beyond. Thanks, Nairi. It's really clear, I think, that the the assumption that speech pathologists look after swallowing issues and dietitians take care of weight loss um, can't be supported. That best practice is that they, they're both involved, that they would talk to each other wherever necessary, identify the need for each other to get involved and collaborate to support the best outcomes. I'm sure most dietitians would rather be uh, preventing weight loss than than responding to it, um, as would most most residents. And the benefits are clear to individuals, but it also makes a difference across the service to get these things right, where where the quality indicator of unplanned weight loss for one um, and, and impact on many others will will be impacted, uh, where it may allow providers to redirect money otherwise addressed on recovering from these impacts and it makes a difference to your to your reputation as, as a provider. Um, this kind of collaboration supported through uh, governance structures and, and culture, in fact, can really make a difference when identifying and managing risk and dealing with risks is what providers do every day to provide care to older Australians in residential care. Kim, earlier you spoke about having processes in place for 
eating and drinking, eating and or drinking with acknowledged risk. And I really want to dig a bit deeper into this, especially when it comes to recommendations for identified residents to follow prescribed texture modifications to food and drink. What, what can you tell us about this? Thanks, Mel. Well, yes, this can feel like quite a tricky space to navigate sometimes. And there are a number of different things that we have to consider and, and balance. Um, they're tricky concepts which probably deserve a whole discussion in of themselves. And I'd really, in, again, encourage everyone to check out the resource sheets that will be going onto the Commission's website specifically in this area of eating and drinking with acknowledged risk. Um, which is a term that we um, use in this situation when someone is actively choosing to eat or drink something that we consider there may be a risk in them doing so. And in this case, we're talking about that risk of aspiration and or choking. Uh, the aged care standards clearly give us guidance around an older, an older person's right to choice and to exercise their dignity of risk. Um, but there are some points that are good to, that we need to have considered and implemented to ensure that we have exercised our duty of care in that situation. Um, it includes also considering how to best support staff needs in this in this situation, where oftentimes staff report feeling a bit fearful or concerned about any um, implications for themselves if something was to happen to that person. So in having a facility or an organisation having a clearly articulated process to guide staff on what steps to follow if a resident asks for something outside their mealtime management plan is really important. Um, and I'd really encourage you to consider um, having a, a whole of facility discussion, but bringing in your speech pathologist to have a, a chat with you and help develop those processes. Speech Pathology Australia has released practice guidelines, as I referred to earlier, for speech pathologists regarding um, processes to support EDA, and they might be um, resources that are really useful for providers to also um, see. But some of the important concepts that um, to consider in, within that process is that um, soloing assessment is the place to start. We need to understand and characterise the level and nature of risk, what strategies might be used to mitigate, what workarounds there might be. Um, we need to have considered uh, capacity and understand who the legal decision maker will be and ensure that they're involved in any and all of the discussions. Um, the process of informed consent here is, is a really important one and that requires specific education regarding the EDAR choices from the, from the assessing speech pathologist to ensure that all the risks and benefits associated with either option, either way of going are fully explored and understood and then a choice is, is documented. Um, we'd really encourage the documentation of an EDAR management plan that is developed across all team members and represents a cohesive action plan across the facility of what steps will be undertaken by all, um, including things like risk mitigation strategies or what sorts of actions or medical support or what, what will happen generally. Um, and Generally, documentation is key, not just of the outcomes, but also of the process undertaken. So our um, consultation and legal advice in our practice guidelines was that um, it's not just enough to have a signature on a page on a signed waiver form. Um, that does not admit provider obligations to ensure an appropriate process has occurred. So it's important to document what the process was that you undertook to get there. Um, just a couple of final points on that though, that re remember that decisions and views and indeed swallowing ability can change over time. So it's also important to build in reviews of the, that EDAR plan. Um, and I guess of course remember that um, nonetheless we all still always still need to remember that um, the obligations to provide high quality well presented and nutritious texture modified food and drink because that will always be a need um, for some people thanks now thanks you've really given us some great insights there into into where to start and the decision making process kim nari i'm keen to think um, to hear what you think about supporting choice for people on a texture modified diet or a partially text, texture modified diet 
and, and how to best maintain good nutrition. Yeah, thanks, Mel. Um, I think one of the things that I think about, and this firstly, um, we do the same, although the, the, the eating and drinking with um, acknowledged risk also includes um, people who aren't on um, texture modified diets. Interestingly, you can still do the same process for people who make choices that um, may be risky for other reasons. Um, but when you get to texture modified foods, now you know you've just got a little sample of things in, on your screen at the moment, and that's a tiny sample of what we see. But it is an organisational thinking around this, around what, um, how you are going to best manage what would be the best way of presenting food itself. Um, when when we it, it requires training and it requires skills, of course, and there are some that are better than others. Now you can choose to um, in some places where there's a number of things you do. So there should always be um, when I come in and do an audit, and dietitians do audits of food and the dining experience. We do look for the food and nutrition policy, and we look at what is the overarching theory. But we look at a number of other things as well, and we will look at how the kitchen presents food and and how the um, management and what the systems are around that. And look, sometimes um, one of the things I like to see is I like to see a menu on the table that says what what is on on hand for the what's being presented to people for their meals for the day but that should also show the texture modified options people who are on texture modified foods shouldn't just be left out as far as um, choice everyone else usually gets a choice of meals and often people on texture modified get no choice so at least they should be aware of what is the option so they can make an alternate choice if they want to but when you get these sort of meals in place you need to be able to present in the best way. Now, some places might be um, uh, might like to use the moulds, and there are pluses and minuses, and we'll go into that as the webinar goes on. Um, but some places might might not like to. And one of the things that's interesting is that it's very difficult to mould the same food for the say the main 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 meal in the middle of the day, and also present it hot because the moulding usually has to be done ahead of time frozen or prepared and then reheated. So sometimes the best option is either piping, um, but that piping that you see in that picture there has to be done with the food hot and that's challenging as well. Sometimes in many places actually the what we call the four blobs is the best option to get the same meal that other residents are eating. The only thing I would say about that is there's two things that are hugely important. The person who is presenting the meal to the individual or who puts it down in front of them says, needs to know what is on the plate and communicate it. You need to know what you're eating. Just because it's brown, doesn't you don't know whether it's lamb or beef or something or other else. And that's going to make a big difference to how you enjoy that meal. And that's important because enjoying the meal is important and it gets a big plus, you know, from people. And so even if it is just the blobs and that's the way you do it, and I'm sorry about that term, but that's what everyone uses, um, that can actually be a good experience for people if the engagement is really good from the staff, if care is put into the flavour. And also just quickly while we're here, don't cover everything with gravy. Even if that gravy is modified in the appropriate way, it's generally, unless you make it yourself from scratch, it's generally a commercial gravy. Everything's going to end up tasting the same. So make that choice. Everyone else might have that choice. So there are all sorts of things that you look at in your own organisation and we'll come back to actually fortifying and modifying. But having those systems process so everyone understands where they're going, everyone understands what happens. Um, just quickly, because I've got in front of me and I assume you do as well, these slides. The second one in those slides shows what can happen when that food, some of that food was moulded before it was reheated and the reheating can actually degrade the shape so it's all very well when it comes out of the kitchen looking great but when the person sees it themselves at the table it might not be the same the systems and processes need to be in place that understand that whole process and make a decision as to how that's run for the individual but from a nutritional point of view we can look at fortifying if people are not getting enough nutrition out of what they're they're being fed because some of these plates especially a lidded um, the, the plates with the rim around them, what makes it easier for people to eat, they're actually fairly small portion size. 
So we need to look at things. The dietitian would look at things like that to give you advice on what you could do to um, to make sure that the nutrition is adequate within the texture modified meal. Thanks, Nari. I'm I'm going to move move on to you, Kim. Next, we we at risk of running short of time, but just to summarise that, that the risks of um, putting someone on a modi modified diet, which they will often tell you, is the risk that they won't, the person might hate it and might not or might not like it enough to get sufficient nutrition, which is why involving a dietitian at that, that stage is just so important. Um, how could services manage deterioration in swallowing, Kim, where a consumer may require changes to their food or fluid texture due to the worsening of it but access to speech pathology or medical assessment in a in a timely way is either restricted or, or limited in some way thanks mel it's a great question um, i guess firstly in two parts the clinical deterioration and then the restricted access Managing clinical deterioration, of course, we all need to have a procedure in, pro in place that guides staff of what to do in those circumstances when there might be a time delay, when there's going to be before a, a medical or speech pathology review um, occurs. So do you have a guide for staff of what to look for, what to do, what not to do in terms of oral intake at that time? Um, what infant observational data can be co collected to help inform speech pathology assessment? I guess in terms of the details, I'd really encourage the um, facility to work with the speech pathologist to work out a local solution in your own context, because I'm aware that context will vary across different locations or settings in terms of a, a time sort of period and, and, and what you're looking to do. Um, but it's certainly important to, to have some sort of um, benchmark I guess or measure whatever that might be it's not it's you know we don't want to just simply downgrade people's food or fluid and then um, not have a review set scheduled in some way shape or form in a reasonable time um, because it's not uh, Nari talked about it earlier it's not necessarily always just a case of deterioration there are also times when then somebody also um, recovers or improves and sometimes we don't get that review in a timely way that might have uh, allowed that person to return to a normal diet as well um, but looking at the big picture I guess I'd say that um, consideration of things to do like in, engagement and employment mechanisms is a good place to start because having more regular sessions with a speech pathologist can often help to um, proactively pick up things before there's that um, further escalation I guess um, ensuring that um, there's an understanding of what appropriate clinical care looks like in the, in the organisation. I know that under ACFI at times there was sometimes a bit of confusion, but um, the Department of Health and Aged Care has recently released the publication How Allied Health is Supported under ANAC, um, confirming that providers are funded for and required to provide the needed allied health services under ANAC funding model. Um, in terms of options and what you can be doing, I, I guess where you've got restriction, restricted access as well, understanding that services from speech pathologists can be provided in a number of ways um, for including telehealth, where that's deemed to be clinically appropriate. So considering what those sort of options might look like in your context. Um, and just a final note I'll make is that if you're ever unsure of where or how to access a speech pathologist, I'll also just note that Speech Pathology Australia have a function on their website called Find a Speech Pathologist. Um, we can go to www.speechpathologyaustralia.org.au under resources for the public, find a speech pathologist and, and search in, in there to see if you can um, find somebody who you might be able to connect with. So my thoughts on, on that. Thanks, Mel. Thanks. Um, we certainly know that when dietitians are involved, you're less likely to have weight loss problems. Uh, and I, I'm really interested in your thoughts briefly, Nairi, on how you can make sure that nutrition and hydration needs are met when a texture modified diet is recommended and, and agreed to. What are your thoughts, including on the use of commercial supplements? 
I'm glad you mentioned hydration as well there, Mel, because I think sometimes we forget about how important that is, not only from the point of view of, um, of health in general, but things like sheer injuries, when people just bump themselves on a wall or something rather and then the skin is sheared, that's much more likely if you're even mildly dehydrated, as well as a whole lot of other issues, cognitive falls, a whole lot of other things. So when we're looking at fortifying foods and when we're looking at changing to a texture modified, sometimes people are okay with the food but not so good at the drinks. And so when they can't then drink what they were as easily drinking before, that might be a, a change that we need to really carefully look at. And it's a, it's a big risk, of course. So there's often a, we try to put an emphasis on hydration. So looking at things like providing plenty of options that provide that, like you can thicken ice cream, you know, the number of places I've been to where they don't realise you can do that. There's, there's, a, there's net recipes provided by the people who supply the thickness. You can thicken ice cream. That's a good way to get a bit of extra fluid into someone who's not so keen. Um, ice blocks that are a thickened um, products um, and also meals that have you know, a higher quantity of liquid in them anyway, even in a modified form, are very important for that sort of thing and making sure that we have those. So, um, But then as well as that, because some people are consuming smaller quantities of food when they change to a texture modified diet or because of uh, disinterest or sadness or a whole lot of things that happen in people or cognitive issues, they might be consuming a smaller amount of food. So what we can then do is actually fortify foods to boost up their nutritional content so every mouthful has a, a greater bonus bonus nutritionally than otherwise would and and you know really some of these things are very inexpensive um, milk powder skim or whole milk um, skim milk just being the protein and whole milk containing some fat of course is a great protein and calcium source that can easily be incorporated into many foods um, there are commercial options that are lactose free for people who are lactose free so we can work on that cheese is a really good high protein food um, legumes uh, of any sort and you can use flowers of legumes to boost up things. Um, but I've mentioned butter, cream and oil in that slide. They're not a protein, but they're a good high calorie addition into meals that can just increase the calories that someone or other requires. And then you can use commercial supplements. Now, I think that some of the commercial supplements are great as, a, as an option for fortifying foods. And there are um, thickened pre um packaged thickened options that are also high protein and they're useful for keeping in storage frozen usually in all in, in um, facilities where there aren't very many people on texture modified so you've always got them because one of the things I find with texture modified foods is the the main meal there's a lot of focus on often the dessert is forgotten about and if you have the same thing every 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 day it gets very boring and that increases it so there are plenty of recipes available there are plenty of ways to um, um to fortify things to boost up the content um and to use these sort of things that mean that people get more out of individual mouthfuls you know when they when they when they're eating anything Thanks very much, Nairi. I'm, I'm going to move on pretty quickly because I want to get to the question and answers. But just, yes. just to round that up with um, ensuring that people who can't tell you their choices and their wishes, um, those with cognitive impairment, those with dementia in your service, that those people are not forgotten, that there are ways to find out what people like, including observing them. So um, really, it's not all about what people can tell you. You have to be a bit more uh, inventive than that. Um, Janet, I'm going to hand over to you in relation to the questions now, but thanks very much for that discussion. Wonderful. Uh, wasn't that great? That, that was just brilliant. There was so much content there, and I expect some of you may even want to check in with the recording afterwards to, to catch what you may have missed first time round. We do have a little bit of time for questions. Now, we had some which were submitted before and others which have come in, so thank you, everyone, who submitted the question. Um, one for you first, Kim, but I'll line up the second one to give Nye some thinking time. Kim, the, the one I have for you is um, from a from a speech pathology perspective, uh, what have you seen to be some of the gaps uh, that, that you observe in residential aged care settings with in relation to managing swallowing difficulties? And Nairi, your question on notice. We've had a lot of questions, unsurprisingly, 
uh, about the differences between the dignity of risk and individual choice and the, uh, the, the, the constraints that are uh, imposed by texture modified food or differences in diet which necessitated because of swallowing difficulties. And one of the particular examples offered was uh, we have families who know mum has a sweet tooth and they're constantly bringing in um, sweets which are not only uh, uh, problematic from a, from a dietary and nutrition perspective, but also create difficulties from a foot swallowing perspective. And yet we know they're doing it with every good intent. So if you can sort of think about how you might position an answer, come back to you, Kim. Um, the educational opportunities that, that you see when, when you engage with residential aged care services in relation to management of swallowing difficulties. Yes, thanks, Janet. Um, what we see and what our members of speech pathologists working in residential aged care across Australia tell us, uh, um, education needs continue to present themselves around ensuring that everyone is able to recognise and act on early signs of dysphagia. So not necessarily waiting to react to an adverse event, but actually being able to um, recognise those earlier subtle signs before something um, ha else happens, I guess. And also the need to um, have a way to ensure that everyone is um, um, aware of the all of the recommended mealtime management strategies. It, it comes as a package, I guess, and not just the texture alone. Um, ITSI, the International Dysphagia Diet Standardisation Initiative, is still um, often a topical topic um, that comes up for education and training. So that's the global initiative to provide common terminology to describe the textures that we use for people with swallowing difficulties. And it allows us to have that really important common language as people transition from hospital to residential care, home to residential care, wherever that might be. Um, and just an understanding, I guess, across the, across all staff as to why texture is important and why it's important to get it right. And I guess the final one I was going to say was um, an understanding of the importance of communication and knowing how to support somebody with complex communication needs. So um, I agree with Mel's comment there that even if when somebody perhaps doesn't have verbal communication, we need to ensure we're finding ways to um, support their engagement and their ability to tell us in whatever form it is that they, um, what they're wanting or needing. Um, can I just be tricky or maybe I'll come back after Nari because I do have a comment to make about um, the the second question about the lollies and sweets. Maybe I'll, I'll wait to Nairi's um, made her comment first. Sure. Thanks, Kim. Nairi, over to you. Ah, thank you. Um, yes, a question, a comment too about, um, no, I'll go on to this first. Right. So, um, yes, I, I think we take every, we need to take everyone individually and we need to look at what they need. And, you know, I often say in the big world, when you're 30, 40 or 50, sugar is a problem. But, but it, when, when we're looking at people who are now towards the end of their life, I see sugar as a really good carrier of nutrients a lot of the time. So there are many people who actually end up with a higher preference for sugar, interestingly, and particularly people with cognitive issues. For some reason, uh, there are reasons, but I'm not going to go into them now. And yes, it's not the best thing ever, but the thing is that if that is going to mean that that person is going to eat the food, that's more important. It's more important the food goes in than that we worry so much about sugar as such. So if the family are bringing things in, it's a communication with the family. Um, I can speak to them, but also I can get them to speak, hopefully, to the speech pathologist. And they can sort of say, OK, look, why don't you bring in um, custard or, or X, you know, um, a particular thing. They can discuss what um, the person's liking get that thing, make sure they're bringing, the family are bringing in the right things. And then the family still have that sense that they're doing something helpful and useful, but they're not causing problems. And and I, I just find that, that, that people are so happy with that concept. And the same with staff, you know, understanding what, what, what are the issues. And 
taking away your own need to not eat too much sugar, too much salt water, it happens to be as a you know a maybe 30, 40, 50 year old or whatever, and 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 thinking that person who's now 80, 90, they've got different needs. Don't post my own concerns onto that person. And remembering too that when people have, you know, that communication issue with cognitive deficit is really important. I often try and talk to the family, um, try and look back on old notes and see whether there's been preferences and try and work with them. So the family can often talk about something that's happened in the past and therefore you can use old preferences, older preferences to come into play now. And particularly if you think of people who are now older, they grow up in a different with a different food scene than what we have now. And often, you know, there's no point um, providing someone with something that doesn't look like a food that they anticipate it's going to look like. Um, so, you know, it means that they may not eat it because part of what we eat is with the eyes. You know, it's not a texture modified thing, but for example, if someone anticipates a lemon meringue pie, it has to look something like a lemon meringue pie. It's not going to seem like that's what it is. If it doesn't, call it something else. You know, don't call it that, you know. So it's a whole, it's a it's a thinking outside the box. Unfortunately, there's no black and white answers for this. We have to go into it, discuss with a dietitian, discuss with a speech pathologist, work out how you actually do those things so that um, so that we can make an assessment of that and, and do the best thing for that individual. Um, whether they can communicate directly to you or not. They might just go back into eating things. I've seen many people who are of a, 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 another um, heritage, another English, another language background, who late in their life start only preferring foods from their, their younger years, which they may not have eaten for a number of years, and even their family don't eat. So we have to put those things into the mix. All right. Well done. Thank you. Uh, I think Kim and Melanie both have contributions to make on this and I'll, I'll take them in that sequence. Kim, you first and then Melanie. Thanks, Janet. But Nairi has covered it really lovely, really nicely, but I guess I didn't want to steal that thunder in the previous question when you asked me about education needs because I, I did want to say that the opportunity to have the, the conversations and the education with the family is something that I see as um, a bit of a gap at times in terms of when the speech pathologist might be brought in as a, a consulted consultant as a one-off opportunity. So I think that's an important component, as Nari has mentioned, that those discussions, having the opportunity to have those discussions with the family is so important. Um, a, so that they have a, an understanding of the why and, and what's been recommended. And often it is just a case of that and, and we can mutually find a suitable option um, for both the, the resident and the family and to, to bring in that sort of ticks all their boxes. But if not, then maybe that becomes a conversation that becomes more one of those EDA conversations where they're choosing to have something outside the recommended texture. Yeah. I'm struck by how each of you has uh, focused on consumer-centred care, that th there's no one size that fits all. It's actually about understanding the individual, where they are in their life journey, what their background is and what they bring into that context and how you can work with the staff and the family, the individual themselves, to assist them to enjoy their meals as, as much as possible. It's, it's really a, a powerful story. Melanie? Yeah, just along those lines, I wanted to put in a, a plug for, for choice and quality of life where if you are going to decide to deny someone something that their family is bringing in for them, that is presumably something they have uh, made, a, made a choice all their lives to eat and something that's going to be of deep family and, and cultural and social significance and give them something that may well taste a lot nicer than the options you're providing for them. If you're going to deny them that choice, you'd need to have a really good reason to deny them. Now, if they've got a, a serious risk of of choking that's already been assessed and this food doesn't, you know, is in the high risk end of it, then that's one thing. But if it's just because you don't think sugar or fat is good for them, you'd really want to question your motives for depriving somebody of, of their right to have that choice and to enhance their quality of life in that manner. And just to follow up there, and I'm not sure whether I think I might be asking Nairi, but in the event that that conversation is had, 
and the service continues to have a high level of concern about the risk that the individual is taking on, uh, documenting the process of the conversation and the outcomes of that conversation does become a really important part of the planning. Nairi, any closing comments on that? Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, when I go in, I'm actually often trying to support the staff as my, and the organisation as much as I'm trying to support the individual. I do see people who are at the very end of their life of who, for whatever reason, are actually eating less food than we can than can supply their nutritional needs. There is an awareness amongst many of them, or at least their family, that this is almost a choice being made and we know there's a risk. And to some extent, I'm, I, I will be able to say this is, this, this is an end, towards the end of life. This is not an unexpected consequence of X, Y and Z that's happening. The staff are doing all they can. I've observed that they're doing X, Y and Z. Um, and the risk is that there will be further weight loss, but this isn't, you know, words around that. So I document that. That has to be documented. I often, unfortunately, see far too much, you know, the care plan was updated. It's, it's, it, I know that has to be done. But those that documenting of conversations that have been had with family and around choices are, is so important. And the same with the um, speech pathology um the you know swallowing issues but certainly in this case you know if, if um someone wants to eat his meat pies you know we we do whatever we do around it we talk around it so yes documentation do not forget it it's absolutely the evidence is everything wonderful thank you and on that note uh, i will close off the the, the q and a part of the, the session because we've come to the end of uh, the time we have booked with you uh how wonderful has it been? I, I am uh, uh, amazed uh, and uh, well informed by our experts, Melanie, Kim and Nairi. Thank you to all three of you. Uh, this has been a most rewarding exercise and I hope also for those who've participated. Um, for those of you online, as I mentioned at the outset, there is a survey which we would like you to complete, which will follow immediately uh, at the end of, of this session. Please let us know what you think. Give us your feedback on this webinar, but also contribute other ideas you might have for topics that would interest you and assist you in delivering really high quality care, which is going to uh, generate the best experience for the consumer. Don't forget to check out the resources and case studies that are going to be on our website, some of which are already there. You can also find a link to a goal planning template which I encourage you to check out. If you have any suggestions or ideas that you've tried and that have been successful in improving the dining experience of your residents, let us know. Send us an email about them. Our, our email address is info at agedcarequality, or one word, .gov.au. Thank you for everyone who sent in questions. Any that we didn't get to, we will ensure that there's information on our website which responds to them. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, anything that you'd like to give to us by way of feedback, which assists us in, in tailoring these exercises to your needs would be most welcome. Our next webinar in the series, series is on oral health. And I expect that many of you will turn up for that as well. Please stay up to date with all that we publish. Uh, don't don't be shy about sending us your questions. More than happy to answer them. Thank you for, for being with us today uh, and uh, take care. Bye-bye.